Hi there. Today I'm going to review some of my favorite clips in some Christian versus atheist debates. And right here, the first one to start is going to be Braxton Hunter of Trinity Radio and Matt Dillahunty. Braxton is a Christian and Matt is an atheist. And so here we go. Stay tuned. I think for most of you in the audience that might be skeptics or atheists, I don't think you have the level of skepticism or atheism that Matt himself holds to. In fact, frankly, and this is just a point about the position, not about Matt personally, I think it's frankly an unrealistic level of skepticism. In a 2017 debate at this conference with Mike Lycona, Mike asked Matt, what if a comet collided with the moon and suddenly anyone could look up in the night sky and see that in multiple languages, Hebrew and Greek, it was written, God exists. What would you think about that was basically the question. And Matt's response was, basically that all we could say about that is, quote, we don't know how or why this event occurred. In other words, he, that was the end of the quote, but in other words, he doesn't think that would count as good enough evidence. Now, folks, I think that that's major here tonight. I think for many people, if suddenly a comet collided with the moon and it said God exists in multiple languages, that would be pr pretty good evidence. Uh, likewise, in a 2014 debate with Matt Slick, uh, Slick asked, parting of the Red Sea, parting of an ocean. You're sitting there and someone says, in the name of Jesus and the ocean parts. You going to believe in God now? Uh, Matt's response, no. Slick asks, well, what would it take? Uh, Matt Dillahunty says, I just told you, I don't know what it would take. You see, you have an unreasonable level of skepticism. And so we're going to show a few clips that are very convincing from a few other people. And so stay tuned. It's going to be good. Here we have Dr. Mike Lacona and Matt Dillahunty again. Now, this is the conference that Braxton Hunter was referring to. Which stands. Empirical data strongly suggests that reality has a supernatural dimension. And this is important because if there is a supernatural dimension, it gives plausibility to the resurrection. This leads us then to my second major contention, and that is that historical data strongly suggests that Jesus rose from the dead. And here, I'm going to make this so simple. I'm going to try to make this so simple that even a Southern Baptist can understand. <laughs> Just teasing. I worked for the North American Mission Board six years. I am entitled to make that kind of a joke. All right, let's talk facts and method. Let's start with the facts. We're going to start, and I'm going to do it um, as a historian, what I would call relevant historical bedrock. Now, a mentor of mine named Gary Habermas uh, calls this the minimal facts. But uh, in history, we call it historical bedrock. And the reason being is these are facts that are so strongly evidence that they have persuaded the overwhelming majority, almost a universal consensus of scholars to agree with them, including atheist, agnostic, and Jewish scholars. Um, so you can't really say it's because of a bias or something. There are some facts that I think are strongly evidenced, but... And I, I think they're conclusive, but the majority of scholars don't grant them. And so it's like, well, that's not historical bedrock. And what historical bedrock is, you use that to build the foundation of a hypothesis. And if a hypothesis cannot account for even those facts, these minimal facts, well, then the, that hypothesis would need to be either adjusted or abandoned. And if you get some ties uh, in different hypotheses that would account for these, then you add other facts on top of that that you can assess with your hypothesis. Paul is our best source for the resurrection. I believe the Gospels are historically reliable sources for Jesus, all right? But Paul is our best source. Um, and in fact, Bart Ehrman, a leading New Testament scholar, an atheist New Testament scholar, and I, we had a written debate last year on are the gospels historically reliable accounts of Jesus. If you're interested in that, go to my website. You can access it for free. It's risenjesus.com forward slash gospels. risenjesus.com forward slash gospels. But I'm not going to be arguing for the gospels right now because I've got, uh, I, I'm limited in time. So I'm going to go with what historians regard as the very finest evidence for the resurrection, and that's Paul. He's our ace. And the reason he's good is because Paul, we know, was a skeptic. He was uh, a non-believer. He didn't like the Christians. He believed it was God's will to destroy the movement that Jesus had started. And so he goes out, and he was arresting Christians, sending them to prison, consenting to their executions. And then he became one when he had an experience he believed was the risen Jesus appearing to him. And that experience radically transformed his life from being a persecutor of the church to one of its most able defenders. 
Paul then went from persecutor to persecuted, being thrown into prison, uh, being uh, whipped, being uh, beaten, being stoned, uh, and, and then eventually he was martyred outside of Rome by being beheaded. Okay, so Paul knew the Jerusalem apostles as well. And Paul claims to be an eyewitness to the risen Jesus. His writings predate any of the Gospels. In fact, it's probably the earliest in the New Testament literature. Paul, three years after his conversion, says in Galatians chapter 1, he went up to Jerusalem and he met with Peter, the lead apostle, for 15 days. And asked him, he got a history of Jesus and what he had said and did. And because he wanted the whole nine yards from someone who had actually been with Jesus. And he also met with uh, James, the brother of Jesus at that time. Then in Galatians chapter 2, Paul says that 14 years later, he goes up to Jerusalem and he meets with the pillars of the church. And he names them Peter, James, and John. And he says the reason being is he wanted to run the gospel message. I want you to remember that, the gospel message. He wanted to run the gospel message he had been preaching past them to ensure he was preaching the same thing they were preaching. And he said they affirmed that he was preaching the same thing they were preaching. They extended the right hand of fellowship to him. In other words, fist bump, Paul. Good job. Keep up the good work, brother. So according to Paul, they certified he's teaching the same thing they're teaching. Now, as historians, we can look and say, well, how do we know that Paul was telling the truth? Maybe he was just making up that story to give himself authority to, that he really didn't have. So, as historians, we look for corroborating data, and we have that. You see, there's a guy named Clement of Rome, and he was known to have been a disciple of the Apostle Peter. And he is writing after Paul's death, and he calls Paul the Blessed Paul, and in fact, in another uh, passage of his uh, letter to the church at Corinth, he places Paul on par with his mentor, Peter. And then there's another guy named Polycarp, now, anybody, uh, anybody pregnant in here right now? Anybody? No? Oh, over there. Do you know if it's a boy or girl? Girl? Ah, too bad. Um, oh, I don't mean it that way. I don't mean it that way. I, it ju the joke doesn't work as well, but that's what I mean. See, if it's a boy, I'd be suggesting a name like Polycarp. Keep that in mind. It's a cool name, don't you think? So maybe you can... No, you don't like that name. <laughs> so Polycarp was a disciple of the Apostle John. And Polycarp wrote in his letter to the church at Philippi that Paul accurately and reliably taught the message of truth. And in the same letter, he quotes from Paul's letters twice and refers to them as part of the sacred scriptures. These aren't the kinds of things you say about Paul if he was teaching heresy different from what Peter and John had been teaching, precisely the kind of things you expect if Paul was telling the truth that they had certified, that the apostles had certified he's preaching what they're preaching. Look, I It's beautiful. So and just think about Paul. He talked about 1 Corinthians 15, which many people, including agnostics like Gert Ludeman and Bart Ehrman, have acknowledged that 1 Corinthians 15 is a Christian creed very early, probably within the first five years. And in that creed, we learn that Jesus appeared after his resurrection. He appeared to multiple people over a period of time. He appeared first to Peter, then he appeared to the 12, then he appeared to 500, some of whom were awake, some of whom were sleeping, then he appeared to James, his half-brother, and then he appeared to Paul. And of course, we also know from all four Gospels that even prior to those appearances, Jesus appeared to the four women. To the, I should say to the women, not to four women. In the four gospels, Jesus appeared to the women, starting off with Mary Magdalene. And the fantastic part about that, that's truly amazing that we really need to consider is that people risked their lives for decades to preach for Jesus, to tell the truth, to share the good news. But we're not done right now. I'm gonna share some more good news with you. And I'm also gonna show you David Wood next. So stay tuned. This is Dr. David Wood, and he is debating John Loftus, and David Wood is a Christian, and John Loftus is an atheist, and they're speaking about whether Jesus resurrected. So here we go. And this is one of my favorite parts. Well, good evening. I'd like to thank uh, Reston Bible Church for hosting our debate tonight. 
The resurrection of Jesus offers answers to more of the big questions than any other event in history. Does God exist? If so, does he care about us? Uh, is there life after death? Do miracles occur? Uh, how can we know the true religion? Um, questions like that. And we had our answers to these questions when a group of women showed up at the tomb of Jesus and were greeted by an angel who said, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, he has risen, just as he said. The early Christians defended this proclamation against critics, and it's an honor to carry on that defense nearly 2,000 years later. I'd also like to thank my friend John for representing the atheist position. This is my third debate with John, and his dedication continues to amaze me. I don't think Christians appreciate the sacrifice many of our atheist friends make when they spend so much of their time talking about Christianity. Anyone can understand why Christians want to discuss these issues. We believe they have eternal significance. But for atheists who are convinced that their existence ends in just a few decades, to spend those decades unwaveringly focused on Jesus and the Bible, we can only marvel that they're so generous with a little bit of time they've got. If I didn't know better, which I don't, I might think there's something spiritual going on here. But more on this later. We love you, John. You're a good man. <laughs> To me, it's one of the funniest parts of a debate I've ever seen. But we're not done. I've got some more. So we're going to go now to Dr. Michael Brown, James White, and another debate. And this one's about Psalm 110. Psalm 110, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand when I make your enemies your footstool. Jesus referenced Psalm 110 numerous times. And of course, he asked, who is David referring to? King David. He wouldn't have a Lord over him aside from the son of David, which is my Lord. The Lord said to my Lord. But I digress. Let's go to it. Let's listen. So here we have Sir Anthony Buzzard, who is the non-Trinitarian, and he is debating with Dr. Michael Brown and Dr. James White. So here we go. I do not go away without pondering Psalm 101. Jesus used that to silence all questions. 110, 110, 110, 110, 110, 110, 110 verse 1. Jesus used that to silence all objections. Marvelous. Jesus has just discussed the Shema. Listen, Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. One Lord, I repeat, one Lord. One single Lord. Kyrios East, that's clear. Echad, one single, one Lord. Then he discusses, well, who is Jesus then? Certainly not that one Lord. He's now going to talk about two Lords in Psalm 101. I want you to be very careful looking at the Hebrew here. It says that Yahweh, 7,000 times the name for God, Adonai the personal name of God. Yahweh, by oracle, speaks to Adoni. Adoni, I want you to look it up very carefully. Go to the rabbi. If you can't read the Hebrew, read it. Because it's been misreported in some of your commentaries as being Adonai, even in the margin, may I say, of the New American Standard updated version. It's not Adonai. It's not Yahweh speaking to Adonai. That would be God talking to God. The universe would collapse. It's Yahweh speaking to Adoni. Check Adoni 195 times. It always is a non-deity title. Yes, it's only a difference of pointing. But it's so important that Jesus used this psalm to settle all issues. God speaks to non-deity. That's There's one God and one Lord, Jesus, Messiah, the man Messiah Jesus. That's exactly what Paul said in 1 Timothy 2.5. One God, one exalted Adoni. That's what Sarah calls Abraham. Adoni. That's what uh, Abigail calls David. Got it? That's the non-deity title. Adoni, Adoni, Adoni. You know Adonai, it rhymes with El Shaddai, El Shaddai. You know it. Adonai. That's not the word there. It is not, not, not the word, although you will find it misreported. Amazing. In many commentaries, you cannot apparently read the Hebrew. Please check Psalm 101. Vow to yourself to check that out and resolve what it says. James, you have a different uh, reading of that. Or the people translating the New American Standard actually read the Hebrew as it appears in the Qumran scrolls that existed at that time. <coughs> and we recognize that the vowel pointing came hundreds of years later. I have here uh, a section from the Isaiah scroll that has the word Adonai Take in it. it this way. I want to see. Uh, there's... There, uh, this has no vowel pointing. This would have been the Hebrew of the day when the New Testament was written. The difference between Adonai and Adonai was added hundreds of years after the New Testament was written. There is no distinction whatsoever. I can show it to you. If you can, if I can show you where Adonai is. It's right there. You cannot tell the difference between Adonai and Adonai as the Hebrew is written at that time. 
Now, Sir Anthony has said that this particular text should be the governing text for reading the entirety of the New Testament. You said that in your debate with Fred Sanders. Uh, the problem with that is there is nothing in the original text that differentiates between these two terms. The Greek Septuagint does not differentiate between these two terms. When you and I dialogued on a radio program in London just a few months ago, you said the Septuagint differentiated between the two. The reality is that the very same Greek language that translates Adonai is translates Adonai in Psalm 3523 and Psalm 162. And so both of those texts indicate there is no differentiation whatsoever. Therefore, when this comes into the New Testament from the Greek Septuagint, there is none of the distinction that you have so strongly emphasized, as far as I can tell, in Just every single... Just to make it clear, you're talking talk 250 B.C. when you talk about the Septuagint, Septuagint roughly. Septuagint, 250, 200, 200 years before Christ. No differentiation found there. Nothing in the original that differentiates between the two. It is, all you're telling me when you're telling me that the Masoretes pointed this differently is that five to nine hundred years after Jesus, they rejected the deity of Christ. That's not a news flash. We know that at that time that wait, they wait, did. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> Absolutely brilliant. Mic drop. Here we go. Just remember, whether you eat, drink, or whatever you do, do it all in the glory of God. Have a great day. Thank you so much.